uh, the stories don't just uh, begin and end in Canada. They actually are across the Pacific. So all the, st uh, the stories that uh, our authors have have some sort of connection, this, this transnational connection. And in a way, the journey to the West, writing across the Pacific, is really this journey across the Pacific to Canada. And it's back and forth, flowing of ideas and stories as well. So that's why we wanted to, to honor Jim with Journey to the West as a, as a way to remember him and celebrate him. We met in Victoria. We talked and discovered our similar origins. You, a village relative, while I, a young boy, sitting quietly on the other side of the coffee table, cups between us. We are together for the moment, but I feel you far from here, for, for, but I feel far from you. You said you traveled and worked up and down this land, and now you have returned to die, to be buried beside the others in the old Chinese cemetery by the harbor facing the open sea, facing home. At the end of my life, will I too have to walk a full circle and arrive like you, an old elephant to his grave? All my memories with Jim are of us eating, <laughs> mainly noodles. Pender Street East. Fresh rock cod, a pleasant smile. Roast pork, fresh hot. Taste before you buy, guarantee to satisfy. Ginger green onions, soy sauce, MSG. Take a break across the street. Find a booth, order green tea, relax. Where else would you possibly want to be? It feels really moving um, to be here tonight and to have the honor of reading from Jim's words and to actually hear his voice again. You know, there's something about hearing someone's voice when they're gone. Um, I'm actually reading from the book that he gave me. This was the, I guess, the first edition of Chinatown Ghosts when we met when I was 16 or 17. And as those of you who know him well, um, he tends to take lost souls under his wing. And both him and Marlene were very kind to me when I was a wayward teenager. Um, usually people don't even want to deal with their own teenage children, let alone <laughs> take in somebody else's. Um, but he was very kind. So the two poems that I chose reflected, I think the first one reflects his sense of humor, and the second um, I found very moving. This is called Inspection of a House Paid in Full. I could not hide my curiosity at your pride in paying cash in full. Can you imagine that today in Vancouver? <laughs> Perhaps it was because you arrived in Canada young and penniless. While working at our restaurant, you came up with the strangest notion that someday, when you own your own place, you could get away with substituting ink for coffee, cheap, profitable imitation. Those wild, hopeful impossibilities made yours a rocky one-man road up the golden mountain. Yet you made it, and today, looking me squarely in the eye, you tell me you have arrived, your family at your side. My last words are, beware the tax man. <laughs> My father came from the rice fields to the city, and there he stayed. Just yesterday, I sat and wondered about all this. What does it mean? Rice fields, a glittering city I try to touch. Both ends are perhaps a bridge, a causeway, linking rainbows, sunny, wet afternoons. From green rice fields to glittering city, the green and glitter merge. Steadily, quietly, outside my window, it is raining. 
Today, the rain nourishes rice fields, nourishes the city, nourishes me. Um, I first met Jim in about 1996 or 1997, so 20 years ago. Um, he also took me under his wing. Um, I was extremely shy, extremely alone, I think, and he uh, gave me jobs. <laughs> gave me jobs that were really quite beyond my capacity, um, including editing rice paper. And um, I learned so much, and I have so much to be grateful for. And I think I'm one of those who he took under his wing for a little while, and then I kind of went off into the world um, needing to leave Vancouver. And um, yeah, I was very fortunate. I'm going to read the aerialist. Are you the pilot? Are you really the pilot? Are you in control? I want a parachute. The world outside is cold and crappy, and I can't stand the wind. I can't swim. Can you understand? Do you know what I'm saying? Am I coming in clear? I am a spy. I see trees. I see branches. I see leaves. I, s I see you breathing on me. Okay, this, is, this one's very different. <laughs> this is um, the Gospel according to Edsel Ford Fung, a found poem. No BS, no driving, no mistakes. All foods, no booze, no coffee, no fortune cookies, no soft drinks. Check it out, one by one. A bowl of soup is like a whole meal. Be precise and concise on every little thing. Say what kind of vegetables. Taofan is that big, flat, wide noodles, like pasta with meat and Chinese greens or bean sprouts. Be specific, like Pacific Ocean. Chow mein is pan-fried lo mein, soft noodles, with beef, pork, Chinese greens, shrimp, chicken sprouts, etc. Sweet and sour pork can be rice plate or chow mein, or just meat, three ways. Be very precise about it. Taoyuk can be Chinese greens or bean sprouts with roast pork or beef, shrimp, or chicken could be meat, only rice plate, or with soft noodles, skinny or flat. Fried shrimp is an appetizer. Actually, it is a ripoff. Expensive, but not filling. Check the middle section of the menu. Be precise on every little thing. Your way or my way. I'll bring, you eat. Or you name, I'll get. Don't leave anything out. You write, I'll rewrite. You specify, I'll modify. Declassify, amplify, rectify the menu. Actually, I'm a fake writer in all sense of the word, not in the Donald Trump sense. <laughs> uh, I don't have anything published, so I'm totally embarrassed to be here with the three <laughs> Michelle, Evelyn, and Madeleine. Um, but I, when I started making my Chinese restaurants film, I got a lot of encouragement from Jim, who gave me all the research. He writes me emails from time to time and says, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. Uh, totally encouraging and totally uh, pushing me um, to eventually accompany what I did. So uh, part of the reading I was going to do for, was uh, a mem memoir I'm writing about the making of the Chinese restaurants. And one of them was uh, the, the one that I was going to read tonight about my own work is the Argentina chapter. And Michelle, I had my fourth uncle in Pender Street poems. That was my two, top two priority, and you stole it. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, fourth uncle talks about death and dying and going back home. And, uh, and of course, Pender Street talks about food. So anyway, I'll do, another, I'll do uh, my second, uh, third and fourth priority. 
Old Chinese Cemetery, Kamloops, July 1977. Like a child lost, wandering about, touching, feeling, tattered grounds, touching, seeing, wooden boards. Etch in ink, etch in weather, etch in finding memories, etched, faded, forgotten. I walked on earth above the bones of a multitude of golden mountain men, searching for scraps of memory. Like a child unloved, his face pressed hard against the wet window. Peering in for a desperate moment, I touch my past. The next one. Hippo luck for Satan. Common smiles, hand in hand. We glide that flamenco's air. The dance floor world a common dish. We dance a pair of common fish. Stewing in the back room heat, where men grew thinner, that gambler's chips. I'm a miner of the mountains of gambler's gold between bowls of borrowed rice. I toss the dice of lots of life, of low life. Numb to the feel of each burdening tile, the clatter a swirling patter of dancing steps. Stay with me, Carmen, as surely as Lord Buddha sits on my right. Make it all or nothing tonight. So in the second part of our presentation, each of our panelists will read something from their own work and reflect on how that selection is connected to Jim, inspired by Jim, or otherwise touches a chord named Jim Wong Chu. So I met Jim a really long time ago when I was a teenager, and I, I don't know how he found me. <laughs> like, I, think, I think I was working at the student paper at UBC, and someone said there was like this half Korean girl there, and he called the office. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I wanted to be a writer, and I wrote three pages. Uh, 10 pages maybe, and I showed it to him. I wanted to write a novel, and actually it, it became this novel here. Um, and he sort of led me through the journey of publication, which took a really long time. Um, and I think for me, Jim, he taught me a lot about life, spirituality, the creative process, how to maintain good digestion. <laughs> we ate a lot together. So I'm going to read a little bit from this book, and some of it will include food. Um, so it is a YA novel. Uh, it follows two girls who are 12, 13, who are half, one girl's half Korean and one girl's half Japanese, set in Surrey, BC. Red maple trees line our cul-de-sac, like candles on a birthday cake. Close your eyes and make a wish. You could probably blow all the candles out. The trees here aren't as big as the ones you'd find in Vancouver. Here, in the suburbs, in Surrey, the trees are younger, weaker even. So small and thin, they need wooden stakes strapped to them to keep them from slouching over. So small and thin, they flicker when the mail carrier walks by. A letter slips through the mail slot. It's from my best friend from across the street. You see, we figured out the scam. Actually, she figured it out. It's a good one, so listen up. So she got this idea of trying to send me a letter without having to pay for a stamp. So instead of writing her address as the return address, she wrote mine instead. 
<laughs> the, the post office people probably got angry thinking, you idiot, you forgot the stamp. Here's your stupid letter back. <laughs> On, only thing is, the lender ended up at my house instead of hers. And that's just what we wanted. All the letter says is, dear Sarah, moi. <laughs> Isn't she the best? She's always been, for as long as I've known her, which has pretty much been my whole life. So when I learned the big news, it gave me this real bad feeling inside. Nothing's going to change, she promised me. But that was the year everything changed. It was the year I lost my best friend and witnessed the biggest missing persons case in Canadian history unfolding right in front of me. It was also the year I almost lost myself. When they first built suburbs outside of Vancouver, it was as though they thought the sameness of everything would keep the outside world away and the rest of us safe on the inside. But the thing is, change happens from the inside out too. So when that last summer came to an end, just before my final year of elementary school, my 12th year in this world, not even the perfect roundness of the cul-de-sac could help me. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm going to have to try that trick with the mail. <laughs> I wish I knew about that when I used to send a lot of submissions out to literary magazines. And it's expensive, you know. <laughs> um, I'm going to read two poems that were written after visiting Jim in the hospital. So they're difficult. Um, they have recently been published in an issue of Grain and are dedicated to him. Um, one, one line that didn't actually make its way into a poem but that I've been thinking about a lot was that I think the first time I visited him, the nurse thought I was his daughter and uh, you know that, that just sort of stayed with me. This is called Stuck for Jim Wong Chu in ICU. When the doors buzz open, the smell of the hospital overpowers you. A stew of blood and urine, hand sanitizer, latex gloves, blue bags of medical waste toppling off the janitor's cart to loll at your feet. Reek of sour flesh, clogged catheters, sweat-drenched sheets and pillows. It coats your clothes clogs the fine hairs in your nose and ears, clings to your skin when you reach for him. He's cold, clammy. His body a dolls in the cotton gown polka dotted with blood, his one open eye unable to follow you around the room. You sit in what you hope is his field of vision, the one brown eye that maybe sees you, maybe not his mind a mystery after the stroke. The machine he's hooked up to blinks blood pressure and pulse rate, says he's alive. He's pale yellow and slack as a steamed pudding. Later in the cafeteria, you treat yourself to something sweet to mask the nausea that throbs in your throat at the thought of them suctioning his lungs, plunging the raw wound of his tracheotomy. A strawberry parfait, glob of custard and whipped cream so thick it clumps on your tongue, sharp spears of fruit glazed in syrup. It sticks in your throat. Um, the other poem was written when um, a friend of mine was thinking of leaving uh, Vancouver and I sort of conflated my sadness at that with um, visiting Jim. It's called The Fewest Hours of Sunlight on Record. When you said you were thinking of leaving, the skies opened. Greedy, gulping trees surged outside the windows, rushing in titanic wind. Black smell of wet earth, tang of metal. Of course, I said, it makes sense. One of the coldest winters on record, then one of the wettest springs. Who would want to stay? 
Along the sidewalk, canopies sagged like soaked sails, busted umbrellas splayed in gutters and doorways. This was May. That night, I went to see Jim in neurology. Snap of latex gloves, cap and gown protocol to ward off infection. View of the parking lot, though he would never drive again. Never order chicken's feet and tarot cakes again for dim sum. Call hours before a grant deadline to say, I'm so stressed, I feel like I'm going to have a stroke. His face drooped into the hospital pillow, head heavy as a milk-drunk infant's, while he ate his dinner, nutrients pumping steadily through his stomach until the machine beeped and blinked, feeding completed. Later, I said I would miss you. What I didn't say was that some days I already did, craving something I couldn't name. Even here, even now, Jim cradling my finger in his loose fist, breathing on his own. Thank you. Sometime in 1996, I think 1997, Jim asked me if I had enough stories for a collection, and I definitely did not. <laughs> I just finished my undergraduate. Um, he, it was for the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop Emerging Writer Award. He said, why don't you submit? And I have to say, I never would have had the confidence or the hubris to think that I had anything approaching a manuscript at that point. Um, but he, I think someone just asking me to do it made me think, well, what is it that I'm, what is it that I'm working on? What is this larger thing that I'm trying to put together? Um, and when I sent it in, there were only maybe five stories. Uh, and it did turn into Simple Recipes, which was the first book, and it, it won the prize. And um, in hindsight, I think he, he gave me this miraculous gift because I think it happened sooner than I expected it to happen. And, and this book was published the year before my mother died. And um, that means a lot to me that she could have uh, know that maybe this, this vocation that I wanted might be possible. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it, this is my father's copy. He passed away last year, and I, I retrieved it from his bookshelf. Um, but it's his copy from 2001 that I signed for him. And so I'm going to read this in thanks to Jim for giving this gift to my parents and to me. It's from the last story, and it's a family in Vancouver. We stayed with him all night. Through the glass windows, I could see the snow falling. It wiped the landscape clean. It seemed that only we existed, my mother, my father, and me, as it had been on those long drives across the city, the miles we covered. The hospital staff walked in and out, passing through the periphery like figments of my imagination only the three of us in the center. From time to time, my father opened his eyes and regarded us as if from a great distance. Then my mother would take his hand. She would stroke his brow. It was the same as before, I thought, where he was going, into another country or into another life, I could not follow. Yet when he opened his eyes, I knew he was looking back for us. His eyes were no longer guarded, and neither were ours. They said only the most essential words, no, not like this. And the fear and doubt that I had hoarded and kept near, I finally saw them for what they were, nothing at all, the aftermath of memory. The intimacy of seeing his body in the bed, of listening to each private breath, his hands loose and open, my mother beside me, one hand on the small of his back. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to read from a, a chapter of my uh, memoir. It's one of the 15 chapters in the book. Uh, this is a, a, a story about my um, Chinese restaurant owner in Argentina. His name is Mr. Jiang. Uh, 
And in fact, uh, in, in my first page of this chapter, I, I talk about death and dying and going home to be buried in China, uh, whether he has a desire to do that. And he told me that, no, no, I just want to, I told my uh, children to just splash my ashes all across the sea, and uh, that's my way of going back to the earth, not so much of going back to China. So, um, and uh, a lot of my, the theme of my film dealt with death and dying, memories, uh, is fairly sad. And in fact, in uh, one of the uh, Vancouver showing one time, an audience member actually asked me, she said, I've seen all your films, how come they're so sad? And, and I said, well, if it's not sad, it's not worth talking about. <laughs> so I guess that's a bit of an influence from uh, what Jim does and after reading his, uh, his poem. So here's the last kind of half page of this uh, chapter. I've always liked the tango, its seductive and sensuous music, and the eroticism and the sexual longing in the dance. And I've always wanted to find a Chinese restaurant owner who could tangle the night away. Sadly, Jiang does not do that. And I'm reduced to limiting him, filming him trying to dance with the rest of the tango class in Casa China, or watching a pair of tango school students dancing in a bar restaurant in La Poca. Ba Su is a tango parlor in Sentamo. Its checkered tile floor hosts nightly tango shows for tourists arriving by the busload. Our last night in the city, after yet another paria meal with more drinking, we walk with Chiang to Ba Su. He stands at the entrance but doesn't go in. Lighting near the entrance is a warm orange glow. Cobblestones glisten after the rain. It is cool, and Jiang instinctively pulls up his collar, a cigarette dangling from his mouth. Kua now steps back with his camera, like a human dolly, to pull wide on Jiang. Through the camera, I see a loner standing in front of a tango bar in a country that gives us the melancholic dance. Afterwards, we call a taxi to take Jiang home. As the car disappears into the mist, hurrying in, into the night, I'm overcome with sadness. This is the book. This is Chinatown Ghost. It's quite thin. It's, uh, it's got about uh, 60 pages because you need 60 pages to form a spine. So that was the requirement for me to actually have a book together. This book also has uh, is very distinct because it is uh, banned in Chinatown. Yeah, this book here, uh, because what happened is that the image here is a, a picture of a poster of Mao. And this is when Mao passed away. And what happened was that this Mao group decided to uh, uh, honor him. So uh, next day, uh, there was just the entire Chinatown was just plastered over. 60, 70 uh, of these posters are plastered all over Chinatown. And then the, the day after, I went down to Chinatown and almost every one of them were defaced and scratched. And I scratched out, um, you know, and it kind of shocked me. I just, just kind of felt this kind of hate, but it was almost like a self-hate. And so I went and photographed all these photographs. And then when it came time to develop, to put an image on this book, is that uh, I called this book Chinatown Ghosts. I felt that the image was apt for it. So I, that's what I did, right? And then, because um, the, uh, the, there's a picture of Mao, the right-wing uh, Taiwanese uh, decided that they were going to boycott it. And the, uh, the left-wing, because Mao's picture's on there with his eyes scratched out, they didn't want to see it either. 
So this book was banned in Chinatown. <laughs> so I'm probably, you know, one of the one of the uh, authors with the most you know, with ob obvious distinction. So that's the cover of the book. I'm going to begin by talking about, um, you know, kind of, kind of a, a sense of, you know, Chinatown now because Chinatown's just going through dramatic changes right now. And before, when I wrote this about, you know, somewhat 25, 30 years ago, to me it was more of a uh, an homage. But now looking at it right now, it's almost like a requiem of what was going on. So anyways, it's called Curtain of Rain. A curtain of rain, another act unfolds. Chinatown, forever changing. You and I, actors, audience, watching, being watched. Pender Street East, nothing dampens your spirit. Quiet, yet dignified. Unassuming, yet proud. Hidden under umbrellas. Steady as raindrops. <laughs> 